Good morning, everybody. Profuse apologies. We've uh, had a bit of a technical breakdown uh, here. Um, hopefully we are back online now. So good morning, everybody, and, and thanks for joining the event. I'm, I'm James Heath, Chief Exec of the National Infrastructure Commission, and it's good to be speaking to you, with you today uh, to launch our Infrastructure Progress Review. It's the Commission's sixth annual monitoring report. Joining me today is uh, Sir John Armit, the Commission's Chair, and I know a number of other commissioners are also on the line. Before I invite John to introduce the report, it's a few very quick housekeeping rules. Number one, hopefully the system won't crash again. Um, number two, the event is being recorded. So by joining, you do agree for your name and any details you disclose through the Q&A facility to be public. Um, secondly, you've all been automatically muted to avoid any audio interference. And finally, after our presentation, we will invite you to submit questions for me and John. Um, and it will be much easier, given the technical glitches, if you submit questions after we've spoken. And we, and we may also answer some of your questions in the meantime. Um, right, I'll, without further ado, hand over to John to take us through the findings of the report. Uh, thank you, James, and uh, good morning, everyone. And can I just add my apologies uh, and thank you for waiting for us, those of you who have waited for us. Um, the purpose of our annual national uh, annual infrastructure progress review is to monitor the extent to which government is making progress on implementing commission recommendations, which ministers have endorsed. And having reviewed developments during 2022, our headline conclusion is that despite progress in some areas, government is off track to meet its long term targets and ambitions for infrastructure. And this matters because achieving these goals is critical to boosting economic growth across the country and meeting net zero commitments. We described 2021 as a year of slow progress in many areas. In 22, our assessment is that progress has stuttered further, just as the need for accelerating has heightened. All of us are too aware that the UK faces economic challenges with an average GDP growth since the 2008 financial crisis of just 1% compared to 2.5% in previous decades, and productivity behind many comparator countries. Addressing this requires good infrastructure. Improving the quantity and quality of infrastructure services will lower the costs for households and businesses over the medium to long term, while infrastructure also supports efficient housing, labour and trade markets. Moreover, large scale investment in infrastructure, both public and private, is essential to achieving our net zero economy. In the UK, climate change is primarily an economic infrastructure challenge, with two thirds of emissions coming from the six sectors in the Commission's report. But we do have a plan. The National Infrastructure Strategy, published in November 2020, formed government's comprehensive res response to our first national infrastructure assessment. The government has since built on its national infrastructure strategy with other key statements, like the Net Zero Strategy, the Environmental Act, and the levelling up bill. So we now have some clear long term goals in many areas. The government backs these high level ambitions with a funding commitment of 100 billion for economic infrastructure from 22-23 through to 24-25. And encouragingly, government has signalled a long term commitment to economic infrastructure by increasing the Commission's fiscal remit. The technical guidance on how much public investment the Commission can recommend now up to 1.3% of GDP each year from 2025 to 2055. However, the reality is that for much of this century, government has frequently underdelivered on infrastructure spending commitments. It's critical that it follows through on its pledges if we're to achieve the changes that are necessary. But of course, it's not just about public money. In recent years, public and private investment in economic infrastructure assets have been broadly similar. The underlying challenges that we seek to address in our report is how the UK can remain an internationally competitive place to invest, especially in the face of the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States and the Net Zero Industry Act in the European Union. And our central thesis is that beyond the just long term goals, a more consistent policy environment from government alongside effective regulation is critical to providing the private sector with the certainty that it demands in order to invest. The need to develop greater staying power is the first of our proposed principles to help government get back on track 
which together reflect the gear change that is needed in infrastructure policy. Where government creates policy stability, investment has followed. Witness the contracts for different mechanism for renewables and the effect of a stable policy supporting network competition on broadband rollout. However, the reverse is also true. We know that uncertainty creates a cost for business, delays or deters investment. As we commented at the time of the decision a couple of weeks ago, the added uncertainty around HS2 delivery timescales and indeed those of the Lower Thames Crossing will heighten nervousness from those considering investing in opportunities unlocked by these transport investments. Meanwhile, government's stop-start approach to energy efficiency policy has led to low rates of insulation installation at a time when we really need to be saving more energy. Secondly, we think government could be more strategic in its approach. Make fewer, bigger, better interventions. The risk of delay on climate change action is now bigger than the risk of building more infrastructure than is needed. In our assessment, government continues to expend too much effort on numerous small scale funding interventions and repeated consultations, trying to keep its options open. As the report notes, this leaves key strategic policies, such as taking a decision on the role of hydrogen for heating, unresolved. Government must now focus on the small number of areas where it can have a big impact and make bold decisions, like the recent commitment of up to 20 billion funding to support carbon capture and storage. We also continue to make the case for a broadening and deepening of devolution. Evidence suggests that with good quality institutions, and better coordination across economic areas, devolution helps to lead to productivity and growth. Government seems to be increasingly recognising this, and it's right to acknowledge recent progress in areas like the trail, trailblazer deals for Greater Manchester and West Midlands combined authorities. However, we say that government must complete the move away from competitive bidding and implement flexible long-term devolved budgets for all strategic transport authorities. And the deals for combined authorities should also include greater revenue raising powers so that local leaders can fund as well as find their own local infrastructure solutions. Lastly, we need to remove the barriers to delivery on the ground. The planning system for handling nationally significant infrastructure projects has slowed in recent years. We need a system that can keep up with the volume of energy and water infrastructure that will be necessary. As an example, Decarbonising the electricity system will require at least 17 transmission projects to receive development consents in the next four years, a five-fold increase on the current rate. The recent and imminent publication of various sector national policy statements should be a big help. For our own part, the Commission will shortly publish a report on how to accelerate the infrastructure planning system, and we will look to government to rapidly accept and implement our recommendations. Now, alongside these four key principles, our report calls on government to progress 10 specific priority actions over the next year to help enable longer term progress. To touch on these and our wider analysis of recent developments, I'll now hand back to James. Thank you, John. Um, we were due to finish at half 11. We'll probably run this event till about 11.45, but absolutely understand those of you who need to leave at half 11. So I'll briefly run through the six infrastructure sectors in our remit and the extent to which the key recommendations made by the Commission are on track. We've used five tests to conduct this exercise. For each, for each key recommendation of the Commission, we've looked at whether the government has a long-term perspective, whether it has clear goals and plans to achieve them, a firm funding commitment, a genuine commitment to change, and if there's been proper delivery on the ground. And you can see uh, our assessment at a glance on the chart in front of you. Now, going through each of the sectors in turn, starting with digital, as John mentioned, delivery of gigabit capable broadband networks is progressing rapidly. Uh, and in 2022, gigabit coverage reached around 70% of UK premises. I mean, if operators deliver on their published plans and government maintains a subsidy programme for underserved areas, Government is very likely, in our view, to achieve its target to deliver nationwide coverage by 2030, if not earlier. On the mobile side, our report today calls for government to provide a clear vision for 5G networks in its upcoming wireless infrastructure strategy. 
the long term strategic value of 5G will be determined by whether it becomes more than just a faster version of 4G and whether it provides solutions to pressing problems. Moving on to transport, the Commission has consistently recommended that local areas be given long term funding settlements to aid their planning and to have greater control over investment. I think as John said, there's been a decisive shift recently on devolution. Uh, I particularly call out the trailblazer deals and the single multi-year budgets announced for Greater Manchester and West Midlands combined authorities at the budget, and also the commitment to provide a second five-year funding deal for mayoral combined authorities, which should also help to support long-term planning. However, devolution must stretch across the whole country, and I think government needs to go further and faster in the areas that John outlined a moment ago. Turning to major transport projects connecting our city regions, I think again here progress is mixed. The integrated rail plan published back in 2021 provided a long-term plan for rail in the North and the Midlands and a 96 billion funding commitment, but we've seen recent delays to HS2, further delays to HS2, and these will inevitably push back the benefits of greater connectivity that are crucial to the economies of cities and towns across the North and the Midlands. And I think government must now act to create a greater sense of certainty around that whole project and ensure there are no uh, delays to the current timetable of HS2 services reaching Manchester. I think much the same can be said about developing the Cambridge Milton Keynes Oxford Arc. Here we need to see continued progress on East West Rail and some form of road enhancement schemes to unlock growth and make the most of this significant economic opportunity for the UK. I mean, more broadly, transport clearly remains far too carbon intensive. In 2021, emissions from surface transport were around 100 metric tonnes of CO2. This needs to fall to around 30 metric tonnes by 2235 to meet the sixth carbon budget. And last year, government did publish a number of strategies on decarbonising road transport, including an expectation of deploying around 300,000 public charge points by 2030. But as the chart on your screen shows, only 37,000 public charge points are currently installed. And with eight years to go, we clearly need to see a rapid increase in EV charge points. The purple line on the graph shows a sort of compound growth rate based on the increasing charges between 2020 and 2022. And this is the necessary minimum year on year rise we'll need to see if we are going to meet the expectation of 300,000 charge points by 2030. So that's transport. Moving quickly on to energy. Um, relying on natural gas for electricity and heating clearly leaves the energy system in the UK far too carbon intensive and vulnerable to price volatility. In 2021, total emissions from the power and heating sector were around 135 metric tonnes CO2, as shown on the chart in front of you. This needs to fall to a combined total of around 50 metric tonnes by 2035. And the Commission has long pushed for a highly renewable electricity system and progress continues to be made on delivering this. Uh, in 2022, around 40% of electricity was generated by renewables, up from around 10% a decade earlier. And you can see the impact of dramatically reducing the use of coal and to a lesser extent gas in the generation system with the darker blue line on the graph. But to reach the 2035 target to decarbonise electricity, i.e. the first X shown on the chart, barriers to further uh, renewable deployment will need to be removed, such as expanding transmission grid capacity and accelerating grid connections. Those two things must be urgently addressed if we're going to meet that target. And probably the hardest single net zero challenge is on heat. While the government has, I think, the stats on that are around by about 2035, fossil fuel use has to fall by around 50 to 60 percent in heat. Um, and while government has set targets for decarbonising heating, these are not yet backed up by policies of sufficient scale to move the dial towards that desired outcome. An ambition for at least 600,000 heat pumps to be installed each year by 2028 is not on track with just 56,000 heat pumps installed 
in 2021, as you can see on this chart. And without a very considerable acceleration, well beyond the compound growth rate seen between 2019 and 2021, as shown on the sort of purple line, the target will be missed. So moving on to flood resilience. Um, in line with our previous recommendations, government investment in measures to reduce the risk of coastal and river flooding has doubled in recent years and policies have been revised to place a greater emphasis on catchment based planning uh, and on green infrastructure. But government has yet to specify measurable long term targets for flood resilience and the ongoing lack of these targets blunts the sort of focusing of investment and means there is a lack of transparency for individual households and businesses on the level of protection they can expect. Turning to surface water flooding, which I think has been the sort of Cinderella sector in flooding for too long, and this is a topic which uh, the Commission published an extensive report on at the end of last year. I mean, as it stands today, over 300,000 properties in England are at high risk from surface water flooding, with at least a one in 30 chance of flooding each year. I mean, in the coming decades, that number will materially increase due to the growing risks of, sort of climate change, population growth and urbanisation. I mean, at its most basic, we've got to do more to limit the amount of rainwater that gets into our sewer system. And to this end, we very much welcome government's intention to stop the automatic right for new developments to connect to the drainage system. But we also need to set clear targets for reducing surface water flooding and have a much better risk mapping at a local level and this clearer picture of risk will then be essential to help local authorities water companies and where relevant internal drainage boards to develop sort of costed uh, and targeted joint plans to mitigate the risk of surface water flooding and given the scale of the challenge before us significant new infrastructure will be required and i think water companies should be encouraged by the regulatory model to deliver both above ground solutions and that regulation needs to create a lane level playing field between above ground solutions and below ground solutions. And on surface water flooding, the final thing I'll say is that we look forward to government sort of full response to the recommendations that we made, uh, hopefully later this year. Moving on to water, um, I think we can all agree that last summer we sort of vividly saw the risk of water shortages due to climate change. The Commission has long advocated a twin track approach to addressing this, both reducing demand and increasing supply. We have set out um, targets on leakage reduction and compulsory smart metering to reduce consumption and the construction of sort of new supply and water transfer infrastructure, if you like, as a sort of the core, the core elements of the strategy to deal with the, the drought risk. I think it's fair to say the latest plans from industry look ambitious enough in overall scale to meet our recommendations on leakage and new supply and, and some progress has been made with leakage rates falling over the last five years but there's still a very very long way to go to get leakage down to the level it needs to be by 2050 and similarly to meet our ambitions on supply current plans suggest that I think at least 12 major infrastructure projects will need to be consented by 2030 so it's critical, I think, as John mentioned at the start, that the planning system is fit for purpose and also that funding is made available to ensure rapid progress on this infrastructure. On water consumption, it is still not clear to us that current government policies are sufficient to achieve the 110 litres per day per person consumption target by 2050, uh, which is marked by the X on the left hand uh, portion of, of the chart. The right hand chart shows that each year between now and 2050, everyone will have to use just over one litre less water each day than they did the year before if we are going to hit that target of 110 litres per day per person by 2050. Um, and we think helping to achieve this is one of our recommended priorities for government this year that John alluded to at the start. And government needs to start by finalising proposals on water efficiency labelling and setting out timelines for action on more water efficient buildings. So finally, moving on to our final uh, sector, waste. Um, I mean, in short, the headline is that we must do more to increase waste recycling rates. Despite the government having clear overall targets, recycling rates have stagnated since the mid 
2010s and local authority collected waste recycling has plateaued at around 40 percent much lower than the government's target while only around 40 percent of local authorities currently have separate food waste collections so we need to see a step change in recycling rates including for uh, food waste by doing a number of things by proceeding with the consistency of recycling proposals and the government finalising the extended produce responsibility and deposit return schemes. Without these type of interventions, recycling targets the government has set will not be hit and the sector will remain a major source of carbon emissions. Look, so I hope that was a, uh, a helpful, if fairly whistle-stop tour through our headline findings. We now have um, uh, some time for, for Q&A. As I said, I'll run the event till 11.45, but understand those of you who need to go at 11.30. Uh, but certainly, if we want to submit questions using the Q&A tab, ideally including your name, then hopefully we'll try and navigate the technology and ask those questions. Um, but uh, very helpfully, we've had a few questions submitted in advance. So I might turn to John to, to uh, respond. The first question is from uh, Barnaby Wharton uh, from the Future Electricity Systems. Uh, sorry, Director of Future Electricity Systems Renewables UK. And Barney's question is, what have recent decisions in the US and the EU meant for investment in UK infrastructure and supply chain availability? John. Well, thanks, Barnaby. Well, the encouraging thing, of course, is that the UK is clearly not alone in seeking investment for energy infrastructure to support decarbonisation of the economy. And you can see that as a positive, significant investment in shared goals, which is going to clearly drive innovation and hopefully reduce costs. On the other hand, the fact that those two major markets are move, have moved with major investment policies in the way they have is a, is a threat to us. And to remain internationally competitive, we've got to offer greater stability of policy alongside fewer, better, bigger steps, as I mentioned just now, where central government is best placed to support these fledgling markets or pump prime new business models, for example, uh, greenhouse gas removals. Our report is really quite explicit. Ambitious and stable policy from government alongside effective regulation is critical for providing the private sector with the certainty that it needs to invest. Now, having said all that, others of you on the call will have a clearer visibility on the current status of supply chains. It's not the NIC's role to monitor individual real-time projects. But thankfully, there are signs that in the medium term, inflationary supply chain outlook is looking a bit more positive and hopefully well there could be risks if in fact uh, clients overreact and the in overcorrect in you know, believing that inflation is going to be um, significant for the long term thank you john um, and we had a second question uh, submitted in advance which uh, i will now ask john to respond to this is from henry murison chief executive of northern powerhouse partnership um, Henry's question was, to what extent has the Commission considered the impact to HS2 of losing the eastern leg? And what is your recommendation to get HS2 services to Leeds as promised in the IRP? John. Well, the IRP, which was published in November 21, um, said that government would look at options to take HS2 services and trains to Leeds, but it's for government Network Rail and other relevant agencies now to look at how that happens in practice. I understand that government was su supposed to publish uh, terms of reference for this work, but that hasn't happened yet. We've not been asked to do any work on this. We don't plan to, frankly, um, as it's now about operational options. However, it is our view that government should get on and look at the options in line with what it said it would do. For the eastern leg of HS2, the report that we published in 2020 to inform the IRP suggested that if the budgets were constrained, then improving regional links between relatively close larger cities was likely to achieve greater economic benefits than building new longer distance routes, not least because existing east-west connectivity such as between Manchester and Leeds is so poor. But we stress that government should take an adaptive approach consider developing further additional schemes depending on its available budget. And as new information on post-COVID travel trends becomes clearer. If it, so I'll stop, yeah. I'll stop there. Okay, John. Okay, um, thank you, John. Uh, we are getting some questions through now. This will be, uh, this will be uh, an interesting to see if I can uh, actually make the tech work, but we've got a question um, from uh, Jenny McArthur, UCL, 
um, which I think is coming back to the point we were making about private investment, the extent to which we think close attention is needed to ensure that privately financed infrastructure delivers the best infrastructure outcomes in terms of some investment and responsible management. I might turn to you on that one, John, as well. I'll publish that question. Yeah, I think the point you're making there is, will we get the right investment uh, in, the, in the right schemes from the private sector? Well, clearly the private sector is going to deliver at the end of the day what it thinks the uh, consumer um, actually needs and will, um, will buy. The government, of course, has the opportunity to set very clear objectives for this and standards and um, the regulator. I mean, to me, the whole trick in this is for government to set clear direction and policies set those for the regulator so the regulator can then enforce through its agreements with the private sector um, the right investments at the right prices with the right consequences uh, for consumers. But um, we've seen with the rollout of uh, fibre how in fact if you can get government agency together with the regulator together with the private sector working together then uh, we, we can have really successful rollout of, uh, of new infrastructure. Thank you, John. Um, I will carry on through the questions. We've got one on nuclear. Um, so the Commission has previously been relatively sceptical of the case for large reactor projects. Question is, what account has the Commission made of the Chancellor's recent commitment to SMRs in the budget in uh, assessing progress on energy? John. Well, I think the, the test for nuclear is is frankly for the Chancellor and the Treasury to decide just what level of support they are going to put into these schemes with the private sector. Um, sadly, they now seem to think it's going to take until the end of 24 to reach an agreement on size well C. Well, if that's uh, um, typical of what is going to be required to reach agreements on SMRs, then it's difficult to be too optimistic. I mean, I think my frank assessment of nuclear is don't expect to see anything beyond Hinkley, uh, Hinkley C before 2035 with the best will in the world. Thank you, John. Um, question, a follow up on heat pumps uh, from Kieran Sinclair um, on heat pumps and heat networks. Um, question being heat networks can take significant burden off heat pump rollout as well as providing benefits to the grid through thermal storage. As our thinking change in the proportion of heat they could provide by 2050. Well, heat pump, um, um, sorry, heat pumps or district? I think a combination of the two, networks yeah. and pumps. I mean, the combina combining networks with heat pumps is clearly a, a, is a major option, um, particularly for those developments which have got to be brought back up to, uh, uh, to um, net zero commitments. And therefore, where we've got to states across the country which are already on district heating, then changing the source of the heating to, to large heat pumps is, is clearly an option. Installing new district heating um, on new schemes is, is equally uh, viable. Uh, the challenge is whether or not the degree of, uh, uh, if you like, dis uh, disruption which would be required to put in district heating to schemes which have never had it and therefore potentially disrupting traffic and uh, and so on, I think is going to be uh, a major question. I think at the end of the day, heat pump delivery is going to be a local issue. It's going to have to be decided on the ground by housing, associ housing associations and local authorities working out what works for them and what is the most effective way in which they can uh, get the maximum benefit from, from heat pump systems. Thank you, John. Um, next question, I think, picks up on the things we were um, talking about in terms of uh, rollout of transmission infrastructure. It's a question from uh, Jen Baxter. Grid is identified as a serious blockage in delivering renewables in Wales as well as in England. What are the top three things we can do to deliver what's needed when we have a lack of resources, both financial and human, as well as equipment and supply chain? I might just uh, pick pick this one up, um, I, partly because, Jen, um, we are doing a major piece of work for Treasury on how we accelerate the uh, planning regime for major infrastructure projects, which will have a lot to say on this subject and we will publish that work in April. I think the the most single most significant thing that the government could do urgently is to publish the full suite of national policy statements. Uh, we saw the ones for transport out I think last week or the week before 
water needs to come and also the suite on energy. And I think why I say that's so important, it's the foundational basis of the planning system. It sets out the clear policy need for that infrastructure uh, and therefore the basis on which decisions on planning will be made by the Secretary of State. And without that up to date, robust and clear need statements, we're seeing a lot of things getting gummed up in the system. I think the most single most important thing the government can do urgently in order to get transmission infrastructure moving and indeed uh, offshore and onshore wind moving is to set out those national policy statements. And we will say a lot more on this in terms of the other things that government could do to accelerate in our report in April. Um, OK. I think there's a, a further question come in um, from Ali Morse, Wildlife Trust, around in order to deliver resilience and environmental improvement and affordable costs, what do you think needs to be done to encourage the use of nature based solutions? particularly with regard to flood risk and tackling storm overflows. Right, this one, you want to take it? Yeah, I mean, well, again, it comes back to uh, having a clear um, policy statement from, from government. It um, requires the regulator to uh, be taking these options into account when it sits down with the water companies and assesses their investment uh, programmes uh, going forward. I think um, pressure continue to be put on the water companies from uh, from all different uh, sources and action groups is is another way in which this can be improved. In my meetings with water companies, they you know, they're well aware of these uh, options and choices, and in a way, of course, in in terms of the cost of the infrastructure, it can be cheaper than building grey infrastructure as solutions to these problems. But at the end of the day, it's going to be a mixture. There'll have to be improvements to uh, their water treatment plants to increase their capacity, maybe uh, heighten their weir levels and things like that. But the using uh, nature based solutions, I think, is uh, is one which will have a, a significant role to play uh, in the future and certainly one which I've seen being adopted on new developments. Um, which, is, which again can be made a requirement of the planning consent for new developments. Yeah, I just to, to add to that, it's a subject we looked at in some detail in the uh, review we did on service water flooding for government that we published at the end of last year. And I think having that clear hierarchy of intervention when water companies think about how they're dealing with surface water, I start with optimising your existing assets, then move to above ground solutions particularly green infrastructure before you go below ground and start pouring concrete, I think is really quite important. And I think, as I said, getting the regulatory model right was a level playing field uh, between above ground and below ground, and that you get more greater surety of funding on above ground infrastructure from the regulator is really important. And we're happy to see that in Ofcom's methodology for PR24, uh, they uh, move towards creating that level playing field, but there's still more to be done. Um, OK, next question is on uh, is on HS2, and I think relating to the NEO report that was released over the weekend. Uh, the question from uh, Nick Jessup being, do you share the view of the NEO that the current plans for the HS2 station at Euston are unaffordable? And if so, how should the government run HS2 trains to London? John, a subject we have uh, debated a <laughs> length. <laughs> I didn't read the NAO reporters actually saying they thought it was unaffordable. They did point out that the cost had gone up, I think, to 4.8 billion from uh, from 2.5 or something. Um, yeah, I mean, I failed to see how HS2 can really hold its uh, head up if, in fact, at the end of the day, it does not come into central London. Um, stopping at Old Oak Common seems to me a second best solution and we should get it between Manchester and Euston as quickly as possible because without that the full economic benefit is not going to be uh, derived from the scheme. At the same time as with all major projects the guys running the project have got to look very carefully at how they can optimise um, their scheme. But let's not forget that these major stations, the ones we're now changing, they've been there for 50 to 100 years. And that's what we need to bear in mind when we develop H uh, redevelop uh, Euston for HS2. We're designing and building something which is going to be used for the next 50 to 100 years. And therefore, getting it right, getting it the right capacity for the future is important. Uh, and the, an extra billion spent in the next few years on getting Euston right um, is going to be a small change when you spread it over the next 50 years with all the benefits which can uh, arise from it. Thank you, John. Um, the next question is on um, road infrastructure. 
Um, uh, and question is, when we think of transport infrastructure, should the creation of new roads be largely uh, brackets not completely abandoned in terms of reducing induced demand for private vehicle usage and uh, suggesting the cost benefit ratios of, of roads projects being significantly lower than investment into public transport infrastructure. I should just say before I invite John in that this is a subject that we are looking at in some detail in the National Infrastructure Assessment that we will publish in October. We are looking at strategic and interurban transport and what a strategy should look like and the, and the balance between uh, roads and rail and indeed uh, we may be saying something in advance of that on these matters but I might bring John in uh, to give a view. Yeah it's an interesting um, question um, particularly on the cost benefit ratio of um, the, the two relative systems of public transport and, uh, and the use of uh, private vehicles. I mean, public transport systems clearly are beneficial um, when they're being used to their to their full extent. What we've seen with consequences of COVID, of course, is that if anything that has changed um, and the economics have changed because if more people are using it at the weekend and less during the weekday, that is more revenue. Uh, sorry, less revenue coming in to, uh, to the operator, whether the operator is a public sector or a private sector one. If we want to reduce the use of the cars out in the country, then you've got to have major increases in the public transport available. Um, and that is going to be a major subsidy by government because you can't run um, rural bus services without major government subsidy. And if you want more of them, that's more subsidy. Um, so uh, it's tempting to say that the answer is purely in public transport. I'm not sure it is at the end of the day um, and that we're going to need to, will continue to rely on on private or hired vehicles, leased vehicles over short term periods, I can see as being something in the future. But we have to have a good road scheme and I have to if, if you are if we were all politicians, um, we would know how important uh, potholes are. And the quality of the road schemes which we offer will, I think, continue to be important. Might not necessarily mean major new road schemes, but it certainly means that what we've got has got to be efficient and effective uh, to get the most from it. Yeah, and I'll just add a point on uh, that from a decarbonisation angle. The, the single most important thing by far we can do to reduce surface transport carbon is to decarbonise the road traffic fleet. It's far, far more important than mode shift to public transport. Mode shift to public transport is important for a set of other reasons, in, including dealing with, with uh, congestion. But by far the single biggest intervention on decarbonisation of surface transport is electrifying cars and electrifying or using other low carbon sources to deal with heavy goods vehicles. The volume of carbon that comes from those type of modes is such that we really do need to decarbonise them, which gets, them in, gets us then into the whole debate about infrastructure and the need to roll out the infrastructure quickly, which we talk about in the report. Um, OK, uh, we've got a question here, um, I think pushing us on what we said on water. So when specifically would you want to see finalised proposal on the water efficiency label and timelines for action on more water efficient buildings to happen from government? Um, look, I, I think I think our view is we want to see these as quickly as possible, but we don't think they will be sufficient to reduce the level of per capita consumption down to the government's target of uh, 100. 10 litres. Uh, so I think they'll make some progress and the government needs to do them as quickly as possible. But I think we also need to look at some wider questions around linking uh, the pricing of water in, more, in a more significant fashion to uh, volume of consumption. And that's why the Commission has previously talked about universal smart water metering to try and create a stronger link. We know that works. Think about 20% cut in water consumption, those houses have smart meters versus those that don't. So I think we need to look more actively at the at a number of levers to deal with this consumption question, in addition to the two things that we want government to act on urgently being efficient buildings uh, and water efficiency labels. I don't John, if you have anything more to say on no, that. No, nothing more to add. OK, that. well, we've kept the questions. You guys have kept the questions going very effectively, given all the technical glitches. I said we'd sort of run on uh if we could to 11 sort of 14 45 but there are no more questions in the q a box so given we've kept you seven minutes longer than originally scheduled i might just hand over to john to give a final few words no well um to wrap up then 
thank you all very much for uh, having the patience, <laughs> particularly initially, to join with us today. I hope you found it worthwhile. Um, you, there's a lot to uh, absorb in this report, which hopefully you will do at your leisure. We will, can, as James said, we'll be publishing shortly on the planning uh, challenges and what can be done to improve that, which is going to be extremely important if we're going to uh, be able to deal with uh, and handle our renewable energy properly and get our transmission networks um, effective and also, of course, on the building of new reservoirs. So a lot to do on the planning approach. But I'll leave you with our fundamental message, which is that what we need from government is uh, determination and consistency of policy, um, without which we will not see the invert private sector investment, which is so important to so many uh, aspects of our economic infrastructure. So I hope you found it useful um, and thank you again for joining with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.